the Kitsune Possession. May 26th, the fifth year of the Kae era. A man who was lodging in a rear tenement in Kudanzaka, Idamachi, visited Kaneji Temple in Ueno with a few friends. Yet, the moment he entered the temple grounds, he found himself possessed by a kitsune and went mad. Numerous people, including his friends, tried to subdue him, but they were unable to, and he ran up a six-metre-high cedar tree. Unable to do anything else, the men watched him high above them in the tree, and then he started jumping through the treetops even faster than a squirrel or a monkey. Then, just like that, he disappeared into the distance. The man's friends returned in vain. Then, around 8pm that night, the man returned to Iramachi as well. When the landlord asked him what happened, the kitsune once again possessed the man. I will burn Iramachi to the ground, it cursed, and then it ran off across the roof. With one leap, he covered five to six metres, and he destroyed all the clotheslines in the 48 tenements. The man was elated, claiming he was being helped by two tengu, and numerous firefighters tried to knock him back down to the ground with their ladders. But instead, the man yanked them away and pulled the ladders onto the roof, swinging them around like wild. That night, there was such a ruckus that crowds from the neighbourhood gathered with lanterns to watch what was going on. Then, the next morning, the man finally fell into a ditch in Nakasaka. Yet when people rushed over to grab him, they found that his body had disappeared. He was gone. Shocked, everyone returned home, but few forgot the riotous night of May 26th at the Long Tenement. The Old Man Next Door In the sixth year of the Kansei era, a certain lord took a Confucianist into his employ. He offered him a room in a tenement on the outskirts of his residence, to which the man replied, I am an old man, and returning all the way to the residence after my lectures would be exceedingly difficult. I don't care which tenement you put me in, but please allow me to stay in one close to the main residence. The Lord checked to see if there were any available rooms, but they were all full except for one. This room was thought to be haunted, and nobody had lived in it for a long time. Instead, it was used as a place to store goods for the daimyo's procession. For this reason, the Lord did not wish to give it to the old man, but he had other ideas. I do not have a wife, nor children, therefore it does not bother me one ounce what type of place it might be. And so, the Lord let him move in. The tenement was cleaned and repaired, and the old man moved in. That very same night, another old man from next door came to visit, and they got to chatting. This neighbour shared all sorts of strange stories with him from days past, including from the distant Tensho period. The Confucianist was so absorbed in these stories that he forgot to even suspect his partner might be a yokai, and they quickly became good friends. However, six months passed, and the old man from next door came to visit him one night. I've hidden this from you all this time, but to tell you the truth, I am not a human at all, but rather a tanuki who has lived in this residence for quite some time. I have become comfortable with you, as you have with me, but now my life is coming to its end, and I will soon pass. I'm afraid... I'll no longer be able to come and visit you. Surprised, the Confucius asked him why he thought so. Until last year, there was plenty of food in the mansion's kitchen, which I ate to survive. But recently, times have gotten more difficult and there is less food to go around. Because of that, I've gradually lost vitality and fallen gravely ill, the Tanuki replied. That is truly a shame, the Confucianist said. I will share my food with you. That way you will be able to live longer, yes? And if you need medical care, I will take care of you as well. 
I'm afraid it's already too late for that. I have truly reached the end of my life, and what will be, will be. I see. If that's so, then perhaps truly nothing else can be done. But I'd like to treat you to whatever you like as a show of thanks for your friendship. A very kind offer. Thank you. Well then, if it's okay with you, I would love some mochi. I will come again tomorrow night to get it. However, I won't come as you see me now. It has become most difficult to remain in this form and I have expended all my energy. I pray you will greet me, however, as you always have. The old man said before leaving. The next night, the Confucianist prepared some mochi and left them on the floor for his friend. Just after midnight, an emaciated, hairless tanuki emerged from beneath the porch and ate the mochi, occasionally coughing and choking it down. When he was done, he crawled back where he came from. After that, the Confucianist never saw the old man again. When the Confucianist told the Lord about this incident, he replied, How strange and pitiful! His body must still be there. You should bury and mourn for him. They searched not just under the porch, but all over for the Tanuki's body, but in the end, they were never able to find any trace of him. Bewitching Mountains Around the start of the Holdeki era, a Confucianist by the name of Miura lived in the Nishiki Koji area of Kyoto. He gave daily lectures on poetry and the sutras, and his home was always lively with the many students who housed with him. A student of his from the north once told me this story. It's written in Japanese and Chinese books that, in all deep mountains and valleys, you can find supernatural creatures such as the Sanmi and Moryo, and they do all sorts of strange things to humans. Recently, numerous woodcutters gathered in my home province and went deep into the mountains to cut wood. These mountains were far from the village and difficult to reach, so first they built a hut and stored food, salt and vinegar in it so they could live in the mountains as they worked. This was the custom of woodcutters, after all. After they built the hut, they went even further into the mountains. They felled trees during the day, and at night, they gathered in the hut to sleep. One day after work, they all gathered in the hut to cook dinner, and once they were done eating, they talked the night away. Well then, let's sleep, shall we? Ten or so woodcutters lay down on their pillows, but one of the men in the middle was having trouble getting to sleep, and he tossed and turned for hours. Around two in the morning, a large, strange creature about eight foot tall entered the hut from somewhere. It was a horrendous monster, with a head like a monkey, eyes glittering like the stars, and pure white fur. This creature climbed on the woodcutter lying at the edge of the group, and then licked his throat. The woodcutter who was still awake was too scared to run, however. Instead, he quietly grabbed the axe next to his pillow and hid it underneath his blanket as he held his breath. After that, the creature licked the next three or four woodcutters, one by one. When it finally tried to climb on the woodcutter who was still awake, he gripped his axe and swung, driving it into the middle of the monster's forehead with a loud thud. The creature screamed and ran for the door. At that very same moment, the valley shook so wildly that the woodcutter feared that the mountain itself was collapsing. The sound startled the rest of the woodcutters awake, but those the creature had licked did not wake up. The others tried to rouse them, but to their horror, they discovered that the creature had not licked their throats, but rather had torn them out, and they died drowning in their own blood. The hut fell into chaos, but it was the middle of the night, so there was nothing they could do. They simply waited, shuddering in fear. As the sun rose, the woodcutters followed the creature's trail of blood. 
Strangely, they found a large cedar tree close to the hut that had been split right in two down the middle. So, that creature was a spirit from this old cedar tree, huh? One of the woodcutters said, furrowing his brow. This sort of thing was apparently not uncommon to see deep in the mountains every now and then.